Hello, listeners. Today is Wednesday, February 28th. Welcome to Behind the Numbers, Reimagining Retail and eMarketer podcast. This is the show where we talk about how retail collides with every part of our lives. I'm your host, Sarah Levo. Today's episode topic is our second ever unofficial retailer ranking. We did this last month in January. We're doing it again. We've got updates, we've got changes, and we've got a new panel of guests. So let's meet them. Joining me for today's episode, we have senior analyst Ariel Fager. Hey, Ariel. Hey, as always, I'm happy to be here. As always, I'm happy to have you. We also have senior analyst Blake Drosh. Hey, Blake. Hey, Sarah. Good to be back. Good to have you back. And senior analyst Skye Canavas. Hi, Sarah. I'm excited to join you today. Excited to have you. We've got a crowded virtual room today. So let's jump in with free sample. our Did You Know segment. This is the segment where I share a fun fact, a tidbit, or a question. I have a multiple choice question for you. Which of the following is not a real celebrity brand? Made one of these up. Which one did I make up? The options are Flower Beauty, Hampton Water, Terramana, or Force Source. Which one of those did I make up? I'll read them again. Flower Beauty, Hampton Water, Terramana, or Force Source. I'm going to go with A. Flower Beauty? I'm going to go with Force Source because I can barely pronounce it. Yeah, I'm going to go with Force Source too because I don't know what that means. Like what type of product would that be if it existed? Rural jar situation. Okay. (laughs) Flower Beauty is real. It's Drew Barrymore's beauty brand. Uh, Hampton Water is real. It's John Bon Jovi's water company. It's a wine company actually. Oh, really? Yeah. I clearly didn't do my research. (laughs) (laughs) Terramana is real. I don't know if that's pronounced that way. It's Dwayne Johnson's Tequila Company. Sorry, Dwayne The Rock Johnson's Tequila Company. For source I made up, I decided that if Mark Hamill wants to start a beauty brand, he can use that. He's always sort of leaning into that one role. Yeah, I was was like, that could easily be a Star Wars brand or some kind of tech brand bro brand, you know? Mark Hamill is always, like, unabashedly being like, I'm making stuff up about Star Wars, and it's true, so... Good for Mark Hamill. (laughs) All right. Now it's time for our segment, the unofficial most interesting retailers of the month list. Ariel, Becky, who's not on the pod with us today, and I, a.k.a. the committee, have once again put together our very unofficial list of eight retailers we're watching right now based on who is making the most interesting moves this month. What does interesting mean? It means new initiatives, partnerships that move the needle, overperforming earnings, notable social media buzz, standout marketing campaigns, etc. This list is hyper subjective, but it's supported with objective analysis. Ariel will present our list in the first half of this episode, and in the second half, Blake and Sky will have the opportunity to edit and argue with our list. So, starting off with number eight, Gap, which just hired designer Zach Posen as creative director. Ariel, tell me more. Yeah, so Zach Posen, for those who may not know, he is a designer and he was huge in the 2000s. He dressed lots of celebrities on the red carpet. He was an official judge on Project Runway for mm-hmm. a few seasons. So, you know, this guy knows his fashion. And a lot of people might be thinking, hmm, a lot of what you just said is in the past. That's true. But what The Gap is doing with this move is appealing to millennials. And that's a really core consumer base for The Gap and for Old Navy. As a millennial myself, I definitely shopped at both of those stores, maybe still do. (laughs) And so I think this is a great grab for for millennials. And, you know, Gen Z is not every brand's ideal consumer base. So I think this is a great play. Yeah, I said when we were putting this list together, Zach Posen is like the opposite of Kanye West, right? Like Gap is taking some stuff that didn't work, that cost them a lot of money, and fully reversing course. Absolutely. Okay, number seven, Sacred, Beyonce's new hair care brand, which just launched last week. This is an unusual pick for us. We haven't had a new brand here, and we definitely haven't had a celebrity brand. And honestly, I think most celebrity brands are overhyped. But this one is Beyonce, the queen of the hair toss. 
And so I don't actually think we're overhyping this new brand. I think it's a really big deal. Hair care e-commerce sales will rise nearly 13% this year, according to our forecasts, and make up over a quarter of the category's sales. So yeah, I think Beyonce is on top. I think Sacred is a big deal. I think one thing that helps to set her beauty brand apart from other celebrity beauty brands is her very personal story from her mom owning a hair salon and running that. And even she will continue to be involved in the brand along with Beyonce. So they're kind of working together and they have this lifelong mother-daughter story that they're bringing to hair care. And they're also serving a market that is still quite underserved for textured Mm. hair, black hair. And bringing premium beauty products to that. And so I think they'll see strong demand, you know, if the products work as well as we think they should because it's Beyonce, of course. Yes, the queen of great hair. Yeah, she's so protective of her brand, like famously. So I don't think that she's just going to put some products out there and see what happens. Okay, number six, Coca-Cola, which launched a new spiced flavor and a limited edition K-pop inspired flavor. Arielle, elaborate on this one. Yeah, so the spiced flavor is Coca-Cola's first new permanent flavor in years. And I think that's a really big deal. Think about PepsiCo introducing Starry last year or maybe the year before. You know, these are very well-established brands who are trying to compete in a very mature category. So they've got to keep it new, keep it interesting. And the the K-pop brand is limited edition, and that's out of its creations program, which is also launched some interesting flavors. They did the Coca-Cola Y3000, which is the AI generated flavor. They've done other things, flavors called Happy Tears and Dream World. So I think they're really just trying to (laughs) spice it up um, and trying to get more people to try their beverages. Yeah, I'm looking at the beverage I'm drinking right now to see if it's Coca-Cola brand. I'm drinking a Schweppes. It's not. No, it's Dr. Pepper. (laughs) I'm going (laughs) to wait for the Diet spiced Coke. As you can see here, I'm holding my Sky's holding up a diet regular Coke. can of the silver bullet. <laughs> I'm sure it's on its way. Number five, Amazon, which launched Rufus, an AI powered shopping assistant. Amazon actually moved down from our number one most interesting retail company last month to number five. So it's still on the list, but it's not quite as interesting as last month. The company did post decent earnings, but other than Rufus, there hasn't been a ton of action from Amazon this month. And in my own personal opinion, I'm still not actually convinced that consumers want AI shopping assistance. We're actually about to launch a consumer survey on marketplaces, and that's going to be a question in our survey. So we'll find out. We'll be publishing those results around the middle of the year. I'm interested. I'm looking for Rufus. He's not on my Amazon app yet. Let us know when you meet Rufus. I do think whoever cracks the code is going to be very successful because this is a true practical use case for consumers using AI. Though A lot of the Stuff around chat GPT and the other generative AI tools that are consumer facing are really just experimental. But this is the first like u- real use case that I think could catch on. So I'm, I'm relatively excited for it as well. Yeah. I mean, a lot of shoving in AI in different places feels like a way to appeal to shareholders rather than to consumers. And you're right. This one really is consumer facing. So we'll see. Okay, number four, Apple, whose Vision Pro headset became available in the U.S. at the start of this month. I think it's fun that Apple made our list because we don't always think of them as a retailer. I mean, we in this room definitely do, but like they're more in the tech company category, even though obviously they're a huge retailer. The new VR headset is $3,500, so I am not buying it. But brands like Elf, Lowe's, Aloe Yoga, J. Crew, and TikTok have all made apps for the new system. I do not think this is another iPhone moment, but I do think it's a big deal. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it's an iPhone moment. But I do think it's really interesting that all of these brands and TikTok have been so quick to jump on board. I think they really just want to capitalize on, you know, the early movement. And I think that the people who get on board earlier obviously have, you know, the leader advantage. Yeah, although like some of this is just leader for the sake of leadership. So like TikTok's new app, as far as I can understand, is like you're still scrolling through TikTok, just like in the background, there's like Mars or like the Sahara (laughs) Desert. Do people want that? I don't. But I could maybe be convinced to scroll on Mars. All right. Fair enough. I guess if I were on Mars, I'd probably still just be scrolling. Number three. 
Temu, which we all learned how to pronounce earlier this month with its Super Bowl ad. Its animated Super Bowl ad played like seven times over the course of the night of the Super Bowl. The three ads that played during the game alone were about $7 million each. So Temu invested approximately one boatload in this one ad playing on repeat. The ad is fascinating because it breaks the rules of advertising. It's repetitive. It's obnoxious. It does not fit in with the Super Bowl ads. And because of that, everyone was talking about it after the game. In a little over a year, the brand has gone from relatively obscure in the U.S. to an e-commerce icon. So number three on our list. I'm going to be really interested to see how Timu can leverage targeted social ads in terms of like things like really making good use and leveraging things like carousel ads on Instagram. And I, I just mentioned that because I hadn't been seeing them on my personal feed until recently. And it's going to be really interesting to see if they can find from their selection of products things that can really target consumers on an individual level based on what they're really interested in, like the way that Amazon is really effective social media advertiser. So I'm definitely going to be curious about, you know, seeing Timu pop up in my feeds more often. Like, what are they targeting to you? Just like a lot of like your typical menswear, you know, sort of like men's satchels that I would never (laughs) buy, but like the algorithm thinks that I would buy, like things to carry pens and whatnot. Um, (laughs) So I'd be interested to see sort of where where they're going to go with it, because it was more targeted than just like a regular ad for, you know, Timu's general product and merchandise selection. So that was interesting to me, but it wasn't, you know, I didn't pull the trigger. Let's put it that way. Okay, number two, Target, which just dropped a new private label brand called Dealworthy. Ariel, why is this a big deal? So Target is trying to find its way. I think I've I might have mentioned this on the pod before. It's trying to figure out how it can compete with Walmart's low prices. Walmart has grocery squared, and it's actually so it's a new Deal worthy is the new private label brand, and it's also expanding one of its other low price private label brands of household essentials. So Target's really going after people who need to get paper towels, toothbrushes, whatever, need to stock up on their regular essentials. And they're just trying to get them at the low price points. And I think that's a really winning combination. I was less convinced of Target being number two when we were putting this list together. I definitely think it deserve to make the list. But I don't know, like Target launching another private label brand doesn't seem particularly exciting to me. They already have like 40 something of them. Well, I think that's why it's exciting. I think they're really building out a really strong private label portfolio. They also just added a line with Diane von Furstenberg, another fashion name that's going to have like its apparel, its accessories, beauty, home categories. So I think by leaning into new, by leaning into low price, Target might sway some customers from Walmart or other places that they might not have before. Sure. Okay. Number one, Walmart, which just announced that it is buying TV manufacturer Vizio, boosting its retail media portfolio. Ariel, thoughts on this one? Yeah, this is um, a huge retail media play. Basically, it's going to pair Walmart's customer data with Vizio's uh, CTV tech and also their audience of 18 million active smart cast accounts. So when you think about putting that all together, that means that advertisers are going to be able to broaden their reach, but also be able to target people in much more accurate or personalized ways. So I think that's just going to help Walmart grow its already really growing advertising business and accelerate that flywheel of, you know, e-commerce, advertising, and, you know, content, which is going to be really, really important if it wants to reach anywhere near where (laughs) Amazon is right now. Okay, so there you have it. Our top eight are... Number eight, Gap. Number seven, Sacred. Number six, Coca-Cola. Number five, Amazon. Number four, Apple. Number three, Timu. Number two, Target. And number one, Walmart. We also had uh, honorable mentions nine and ten of Shopify for adding a bunch of AI everywhere and Crocs for really having a, a strong year, but they didn't quite make our top eight. So now it's time for our second half, where Blake and Skye get to tell us where we went wrong, or maybe just where we need some edits. 
Each of them will have a chance to move a brand up or down in our rankings list and to add a new company entirely. So Sky, make a move, which is up or down. So I would like to move Amazon up to number two for this month because in addition to reporting really strong Q4 results for last year, they basically dominated the holiday season. But looking ahead on January 29th, they launched an ad-supported tier on Prime Video, which essentially defaulted all of its 160 million plus Prime viewers into an ad-supported tier. And they're estimating that more than or roughly two-thirds of those viewers are going to stay in that tier rather than pay an extra $2.99 a month for ad-free. And this is really part of Amazon's big strategic shift to become an advertising powerhouse that can reach customers across the marketing funnel from the top of the funnel on CTV right down to search on the Amazon-owned properties. And we're forecasting that this move is going to add some $1.7 billion plus to Amazon's ad revenues this year. That's a just to its CTV ad revenues this year, actually. So that's a huge move. It's really shaking up the CT advertising landscape and the retail media advertising landscape. It's pushing competitors like Walmart to really make some big moves like the Vizio acquisition. But Amazon's still going to retain the upper hand there for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I think that's a fair move. I think we overlooked this as a retail move because it's an advertising move, but obviously it's retail media and we talk all the time about how retail media is like the future of CTV advertising data. So I do agree that Amazon introducing ads on Prime Video can't be overlooked. And it will more strongly innovate to connect the targeting to shopping and commerce, the content on Prime Video to being able to shop. So it's already rolled out some QR code innovations where you can shop from your TV and it's allowing targeted advertising on CTV where different versions of ads can be shown to different consumers based on the advertiser's requirements. Yeah, I totally agree that Amazon adding ads to Prime Video is a big move. We definitely touched on that last episode, the last time we did this ranking. But it's important to note that even though the move happened at the very end of January, obviously, it is still rolling out into February. So there's definitely a reason to have Amazon higher up in the rankings. So I'm accepting this move. Are you, Ariel? I'll accept it. All right. Blake, your turn to make a move. I'm going to move Apple from wherever it is now up to number one. And if you Apple don't is it, at number four. And if you don't accept it, then you're not visionaries like I am. Um, because <laughs> I do think that the Apple Vision <laughs> Pro is a huge, hugely interesting story because we – Saw it roll out with some fanfare, but I think the big question, the looming question was, are people going to buy these products? Do people need them? And that, that was really the question that the market was asking when the iPad came out and then when the Apple Watch came out. And then these became, you know, massive hits for Apple. And I will caveat it with, I'm not personally sold that the Apple Vision Pro is going to be the next iPad or Apple Watch, but the consumer electronics market has been really sluggish over the last couple of years. And they're really, it really needs a new type of product to jumpstart growth. And it really seems like at this point, at least the Vision Pro and, you know, VR headsets are really the only thing cooking right now in terms of like potential for, for jumpstart starting that market. So I think whether it's successful or not, it's a hugely interesting story. And the fact that Apple has been able to make the splash that it has with this release is warranted as the most interesting story in retail this month. Ariel, thoughts? I got to respectfully disagree. <laughs> I mean, I think while it's certainly interesting, interesting enough for us to have listed it as four, number four, I think that the retail implications are still, you know, 
down the road. I think we're still not seeing commerce happen. I mean, obviously it just came out, so that's very new. I think the price point is still too high for it to really be super adopted by consumers. $3,500. Yeah. I just, while I agree there is some kind of forward looking implications, I just don't think we're going to see that yet. So I think I would pause on moving Apple up for the time being. Tech evangelists get by so much on saying, if you disagree with me, you're not a visionary. And I know you're joking. (laughs) You guys are just, you know, you're the people that didn't buy that that Apple stock before the iPod came out. You're missing out. Yeah, well, that is because I was in middle school. um, (laughs) No, but I I, I, I caveated it with the fact that I'm not personally convinced that it's going to be. But we're talking about interesting here. And it's definitely interesting. We're not talking about most successful. Okay. I'm keeping Apple where it is. It made the list. It entered the list. That's huge. It doesn't need to be higher on the list. It created a new product. The new product is too expensive for anyone to afford unless they're already driving their cyber truck around and want to also get in a car crash while they're wearing their headset. I saw a video online of some guy at the U2 concert at the Sphere wearing an Apple Vision Pro while watching the concert. And then it was maybe one of the funniest things I've ever seen. That's just a recipe internet. for motion sickness. That's That no. video can rank high. Uh, for now, we're <laughs> keeping our list as is with Sky's Move. So right now, the, as the list stands, we have from top to bottom, Walmart, Amazon, Target, Timu, Apple, Coca-Cola, Sacred, and Gap. Now it's time for our wild cards. Yeah! This is where both Blake and Sky will have the opportunity to add a new company to the list. So, Blake, what is your wild card? Um, I'm going to introduce Meta to the list. I'm familiar. Okay. So, <laughs> my my thoughts around Meta are sticking with the Apple Vision Pro because I don't know if you saw that video that Mark Zuckerberg released, which was like shot in the context of like when a celebrity does something wrong and has to apologize and they're just like sitting in a non discreet room and it's unedited. And, and he's just basically talking about how he believes the Meta Quest Pro is a superior product to the Apple Vision Pro. And again, I found it very interesting. Because when I watched it, I was like, this seems like really desperate. Like, this is sad. This is like rushed. Like, it seemed panic. It's just like a, some guy on an ego trip. And then I started like reading the comments and people were like, oh, like Zuck's going off. Like, he's still got it. And everyone was sort of like giving him weirdly a lot of credit for like what was perceived to be like a, a ballsy move, like off the cuff move. So I think that. If we're sort of continuing this idea that, you know, VR is sort of this one t- tool that has the potential to like restart the consumer electronics market, I'm very interested to see if Meta will be successful in selling hardware. And I found that video to be oddly disturbing and compelling at the same time. Like, I'm sorry to naysay you twice, but I don't think we can. If every time Mark Zuckerberg released a video that was weird, that a bunch of people (laughs) said was cool. If every time that happened, we'd have to be like, that's interesting. We'd have to do that every time Mark Zuckerberg released a video. (laughs) (laughs) That's a fair point, actually. I will take that. But I still I still find it interesting nonetheless. I would argue that. Yeah, I'm I'm in the same opinion as Sarah. I would also argue that Meta's headset has been out and nothing has happened. So in terms of drumming up business for it, I'm not really seeing any any real upward trend happening. Like when we are recording the podcast a year from now in like VR space in the metaverse <laughs> wearing our headsets, you have permission to virtually beat Ariel and I up in our virtual <laughs> little world. I'm just I, I'm I sorry. Didn't I didn't agree I, to that. <laughs> I, I'm I siding with the innovators. You know, anybody can buy a TV company, but I'm I'm going with the people who are creating. Can you buy a TV technology. company? And, and any any big retailer, you know, with a little bit of dough in their pocket, you know, they can buy something. But I, I'm siding with the with this the creators. Sky, but- who is your wild card? I'm also going to side with the creators in a different sense and add TikTok shop to the list. I'd like to see them on there because they're really starting to push live stream creators and the development of live streaming in the U.S. And 
investing in a new platform called the Star Creator platform to start to develop live streaming talent in the U.S. It needs those kinds of people who are going to be able to talk a lot about products, show them, engage the, the audience, and ultimately sell. And I think TikTok so far has is the only one of the marketplaces with Chinese roots. The others are Temu and uh, Xi'an. Um, but TikTok's the only one that's been able to get real brands on the platform to spend, invest and try out TikTok shop and live streaming. Uh, beauty brands and smaller brands are the main ones so far, but I think we're going to see this expand and we're seeing a little more traction around live streaming in recent news network live stream platform just announced that it was going to buy complex the content and commerce part of buzzfeed that's really focused around streetwear and trendy style and Shein also announced that it's going to live stream its upcoming collection of fashion on various platforms not tiktok but competitors like instagram and x and facebook but i think tiktok still has the eyeballs to push live streaming forward it's also building out studios in la for live streaming and it's helping to really start to grow in terms of selling and having the most traction there with brands so i think that's why i'd like to put tiktok on the list I definitely agree that TikTok Shop is a huge deal right now. On my own feed, I've recently seen the find similar products on TikTok feature where if someone's doing like a makeup tutorial, like that palette then will show up in TikTok Shop. I've seen that feature more and more. I'm not convinced that TikTok Shop made big enough moves this month to warrant them being on the list. I'm of two minds about it. I agree with Sarah that we haven't really heard anything concrete about what TikTok has been doing. It's, you know, it seems like a lot of creator stuff. But at the same time, I do feel like we are talking about TikTok shop every day. <laughs> so, you know, it's definitely become something that is so ingrained in our everyday lives as consumers. I know I see it on my TikTok feed all the time. And also as analysts, um, when we're talking about retail and e-commerce. So I think ultimately I will accept adding TikTok shop to the list. I don't know what it means when we have a uh, disagreement between Sarah and I. <laughs> well, if we added in that that sort of you have to fight in the metaverse. <laughs> that, if we added in that nudges gap out, do you feel like I think that so? Is... I think so because All while right. Gap's doing something interesting with Zach Posen, I think TikTok Shop will continue to be something that is cutting yeah. edge for uh, a very long time into the future. All right, let's put them. Let's put them in there. Sorry, Zach Posen, and sorry Blake, who didn't convince us of his changes. And I, I will note some news out from the information. So they reported on Flexport, which is a logistics service that inked a deal with TikTok to fulfill TikTok shop orders, and they reached revenues of something around five hundred million last year, and a lot of that was due to partnering with TikTok. And so that deal is now helping them target an IPO for next year. Yeah, that's a good point. It's not super flashy. It's not a huge, you know, big ad dealer, but those are things that are going to help TikTok have its e-commerce business and boost that. So, okay. So we have our final list in eighth place. We have TikTok shop in seventh place. We have sacred Beyonce's hair care brand, sixth place, Coca-Cola, fifth place, Apple, fourth place, Timu, third place, Target, second place, Amazon, and our winner, our number one for this month is Walmart. Thank you guys all for being a part of making this list and being on the podcast. Thank you, Ariel. This has been super fun. Thank you, Sky. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Blake. Uh, you're welcome. I'll see you all in the metaverse. <laughs> see you in the metaverse. <laughs> Please give us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on Instagram at Insider Intelligence. Thank you to our listeners and to Victoria, who edits the podcast and is never a wild card. That's actually not true. A lot of times she's a wild card. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of Reimagining Retail and eMarketer podcast. And tomorrow, join Marcus for another episode of the Behind the Numbers Daily. Come, come, come.